All around us are every kind of religion, and I suppose if there's been a proliferation of anything over the last 50 years, it's been this, that, and the other religion. But one thing about it, and I said it this morning in the auditorium class, if anybody who claims to believe in God and Christ as their Savior and the Bible is the Word of God, but has as its doctrine and religion that the heart does not have to be changed, then they've missed the boat on the salvation offered by God through Christ in His gospel. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19, our Lord said concerning the biblical heart, For out of the heart come forth evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, railings. Now Jesus said that. Jesus knew what was in man. Thus, we must be mindful of the need of the changed heart. Because these heinous sins are first committed in the heart. And we might say right now, simply for the sake of this study, whatever the biblical heart is. When you have a spring of water, the source of that water is very important. If the source of the water is pure then that goes a long way toward making the stream flowing from it to be pure. If man's heart is kept pure, then his life will be kept pure. And again, we must know how the Bible defines purity, and thus we are speaking of spiritual purity. I think this, from Matthew 15, 19, is sufficient to anyone who believes the Bible to be the infallible and errant, all sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to prove the absolute necessity if one would become a Christian and live faithful to the Lord as a child of God of a change, a radical change of heart. Sometimes we see even members of the church, or at least outwardly they so appear to be, members of the Lord's church. Let's keep in mind the Lord's the only one that really knows, because He knows the heart. He's the one that does the adding to His blood-bought body. That they really either have never been converted, that is, had a true change of heart as the Bible defines it, or they've gone away and left, gone back to the ways of the world, and once again developed their heart as the Lord described wicked hearts in Matthew 15, 9. We can't blame God for this. Man's a free moral agent. You have the power of choice. You choose good as the Bible defines the good and to put it into practice through your thinking and through your conduct or you reject it and you do something else that is not God's will. The scriptures make it very plain then that we need to know what the Bible teaches about what the human heart is the importance of that change that's involved in the conversion process. And we need to understand that it must be something that is kept. Thus, we have to know what the heart is, first of all. We think of man, and fundamentally he has a twofold nature. The heart, as the Bible is concerned with it, is actually talking about the very seat of your being. The, the very seat of life, the fact that that is your real person, the inward man that dwells in this fleshly body. We know that we have a human heart, 
And we know the significance of that fleshly heart to the functioning of this body. And thus the invisible heart, the inward man, is called the heart because it's so significant and so important. It's the real you. And even as the fleshly heart is necessary to cause the blood to flow through the body, which blood takes all the nutrients and especially the oxygen to every part of it, and if you stop that, then uh, death comes shortly. The inward man then is so important because when physical death comes, it continues on. It will never cease to be. We must therefore know what is meant by this radical change of heart and how it takes place if we would become Christians and if as Christians we continue to keep that heart pure. We've seen preachers of denomination not understanding the biblical teaching concerning the definition of the inward man or human heart just pound right here and talk about heartfelt religion. Well, you know, we're to speak as the oracles of God. So we try, I should try to view the biblical heart from the perspective in, of inspiration. We would do better to knock ourselves on the head and say the change of heart if you're going to get closer to the instrument that's connected to that. And yet even then, let's not confuse the brain with being the heart. No one knows how the invisible, the spiritual... The inward man is fully connected to that which is physical and material. It certainly does it some way, but nobody can know. So we need to understand that the Word of God, the Gospel of Christ, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, is directed at the inward man, or it's directed at the heart. Thus, in Luke 8, you'll see that each soil was a heart represented a state of mind, a way of thinking, an attitude. And verse 15 tells about the good and honest heart. You might do well sometime just to study about how do you have a good and honest heart. That's, a, that's another one. We're just sort of in the introduction to that here, but it's a rich study to understand how can I form in me my inward man to be a good and honest heart, as the Bible defines good and honest, not as I might think it would be or some other human might. Many people think that this change is simply what God does to us. Man doesn't have a thing in the world to do with it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. By the very fact that God in the Bible has written His message of salvation on our level of understanding should tell us that we have something to do. If nothing else, He put it here to be read and understood. Paul said to the Ephesians, when you read, you'll know what I know regarding salvation, regarding the church, regarding the human heart for that matter. Anything that has to do with the gospel of Christ. So man must do something if it's nothing more than to honestly study the Bible revealed by God in words on your level of understanding and mind. And it's not directed at the physical, it's directed at the inward man or the heart. We learn, again, since I've used inward man so much, and in the auditorium class we mentioned that not long ago, Paul's writing to the Corinthians in the second letter, chapter 4, and verse 16, he talks about the outward man and how it's, perishing or decaying, and he talks about the inward man and how it's renewed day by day. I don't care how young or old you are in physical chronology, chronology uh, your heart is not old. Not the way the physical body is old. There are no gray hairs on the heart. There are no wrinkles on the heart. It's just you. And what makes you, you, or any human, a human being, is just the way that it is. Now, it's interesting that when you look at the human heart, the physical heart, if you prick it, it can't take much of that <laughs> without you ceasing to be physically. It's interesting to read what is said about the death of Absalom in 2 Samuel 18 and verse 14. 
Notice that it is said of his death, he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom. Now, one wasn't good enough, I suppose, so he hit him with two more. Third time's the charm. Uh, this man was dead, and the, <laughs> he was going to be made dead and made sure he was dead. But when the heart of the inward or spiritual man is pricked, the outward man is untouched. Remember the first recorded gospel sermon on that first Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 as Luke records it, Peter's preaching, and the scripture says concerning the message preached, the word preached, the gospel preached, and the gospel's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. That it says those who were hearing, it says now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard this. What did they hear? The message that proved that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is the Savior of the world. And also the message that said you didn't recognize him and you've taken him with wicked hands and crucified and slain the Son of God. Then mentioned the fact that God didn't leave him dead but raised him up. And quoting scripture all along from the Old Testament that foretold all of this. And these devout Jews gathered in every nation under heaven. They received that truth. But it pricked them in their inward man. The truth of the matter is, it pricked their conscience. How did it do it? The information told them the very one we look for, we put to death in our ignorance, in our rebelliousness. And now, they want to know what they're to do to remedy the problem. They hurt inwardly. Have you ever hurt inwardly? I don't mean the physical pain. Although certainly mentally, if you messed up too long, it can actually bring about physical problems. I understand that. But I'm talking about when you received information and you understood that information in the heart that it caused you just to have a sinking feeling. Or maybe it was good news and it lifted you up. But we've all had our conscience hurt us. And woe be to the person whose conscience will not be pricked or hurt anymore. The hearts of these Jews were pricked pricked by the glad tidings of Jesus Christ and all that goes along with that. And I think it's good to emphasize here that the glad news, the good news of Christ and the gospel is the only thing that will prick the honest and good heart, that will hurt the conscience. Isn't that interesting? The world wants to have you, whatever you are religiously and about any other way, never have a bad feeling. Because anybody that gives you that bad feeling, then you're supposed to say you're judgmental. You're supposed to feel bad, but not make me feel bad. The Word of God, being the good Word of God, aimed at man where man is, lost in sin, is designed to make man feel bad. Now, if his conscience is seared, it won't make you feel bad. But if his conscience is as it ought to be, which we'll talk more about that in a minute, then it's going to be pricked by the truth that's in the gospel. It makes a man see himself as he really is. As God sees him. It makes him see that he has transgressed God's will and stands condemned before God. And that no man can save him. That he must turn to God in God's way in order to be saved. That's why the Lord himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. So the hearts of these Jews were pricked with the gospel of Christ. Of course, Absalom's heart, when it was pricked, he died. Now, the two different hearts then, fleshly and inward man, were acted upon by two different weapons, if you want to call it that. It was the heart of the inward man that the gospel of Jesus Christ influenced, touched, or pricked. It's evident that this is the heart which is changed when one is converted or going through the process of conversion to Christ. The fact is made still plainer by studying the very analysis 
of the inward man or heart and what it does. That is, its exercises. So let's look at that for a little bit. The whole of the heart is made up of component parts. To understand the whole heart, we must look at each component part. A component part of the heart is a necessary thing to the heart. So let's do that. The heart is that part of man that has a component part, a constituent element that is intellectual. It is the intellect. In Matthew 9 and verse 4, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? So I know the heart, the inward man, thinks. In Mark 2, 8, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? So I know it not only thinks, but it reasons. In Matthew 13 and 15, I read that they understand with the heart. So I see the intellect of man being a part of the heart with the thinking and the reasoning and the understanding taking place there. But I read also in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 from the pen of Paul, with the heart man believeth. Thus it's the heart that believes. So when you examine the intellectual part of man, you're talking about a component part, of what the Bible calls the heart. It thinks, it reasons, it understands. That's where faith or belief is formed. That's why you see that in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God conveys information that is received into the heart where the thinking and the reasoning and the understanding and the believing takes place. Thus, without the Word, there, there can't be any of these things take place. And it helps us understand better why those Jews were very attentive to the message preached by Peter and the other apostles so that they were pricked in their heart. Listen, they, they thought about that. They reasoned with the message that was preached to them by the apostles. And they understood it. They believed it. They had confidence based upon the evidence preached. And they were pricked in their heart. So the Bible says the human heart thinks, it reasons, it understands, and it believes. We would just simply say this is the intellectual part of the heart. So what the Bible ascribes to the heart, man attributes to the intellect. The heart is also seen to be the attribute, that attribute of man, that we would call emotion. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16, the scripture reads, She despised him in her heart. And so I see that that attitude that one can have toward another is in the heart. Romans 10 and verse 1, Paul wrote, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God, American Standard says supplication to God, is for them, speaking of Israel, that they may be saved. So I see you can despise someone and that takes place in the heart I can see that your desire about something or for something takes place in the heart and then in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart all thy heart so here we have despising and desiring and loving taking place in the heart and then also trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Proverbs 3, 5. And you see there that confidence and that trust connected much with belief is also there, Proverbs 3 and verse 5. So here we have the intellectual part of man or the heart, the inward man. And we have then the emotional aspect as man calls it having to do with despising and desiring the various kinds of loves that man has, and so on. 
But we also see that the heart is that quality of man that uh, we would call the human will. The human will. His free moral agency. In 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 37, Paul penned, hath determined this, notice determined this, in his own heart. So there's where determining takes place. In Hebrews 4.12, he talks about the thoughts, which harkens back to the intellect. And then he talks about the intents, the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there's where you intend to do something. In Acts 11 and verse 23, it is said that with purpose of heart, they would cleave to the Lord. With purpose of heart. And then in Romans 6, 17, he says of those Roman Christians in the process of their becoming Christians, ye were obedient from the heart. Uh, notice that the heart determines, it intends, it purposes, and it obeys. And so man calls this part of his inward man or heart the will or volition. But God just calls it the heart. The heart is that faculty of man called conscience. Conscience. Notice what we have in 1 John 3, 20 and 21. If our heart condemns us, God's greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have boldness toward God. 1 John 3, 20 and 21. So you can see the heart condemns or it does not condemn. And man calls that the conscience. It's the it's the highest court of your being. It will render its decision on the basis of the standard of right or wrong that you have. The conscience will only speak to you, if you want to use that terminology, on the basis of whatever your standard of conduct is. So if you believe uh, God has strongly told you to go kill all of your enemies, your conscience is not going to bother you. And of course, if you were Indians back here nearly 200 years ago, 160 years ago, that's pretty much their attitude. And they could attack settlers coming into the country and burn the man on the wagon wheel and drag off the kids and the women. And if the baby cried too much, just bash its brains out and go right on. And their conscience didn't bother them. You say, what's wrong with them? They just lived up to their standard as to how, say, the Comanche Indian was to treat somebody else. But now if you take that human being and over a period of time teach him the truth of God's word, the absolute moral conduct, he can't do that anymore. And his conscience not eat him alive if he even bring himself to do it. So your conscience can only work right if you've already been taught intellectually the proper standard. These scriptures, though, make it very plain that the heart of the inward man is that part of man which embraces the intellect, the emotions, the will, and the conscience. It includes the whole of man's inner being or nature. In fact, you can't get any closer to fully understanding what you are, except in that way. I don't know how you could go beyond that. That's the very core of your being. What makes a human being, being. And that never ceases to be. It will always be. Whether it is in this temporary dwelling place, the human body, or whether it's in eternity, after the world and the judgment day in heaven or hell. You will always be who you are. And listen, you're taking your character into eternity with you. And your character is formed by what you believe. And what guides you. And what directs you. 
Your attitude, your state of mind is formed by all those things. This life in the flesh is time to form your attitude that is your being with a disposition that is in the likeness of Christ. And that takes conversion. And conversion is brought about by conviction. And that conviction must be by the truth of the gospel and nothing else. Now you understand better, I hope, why Paul was so upset when people were about to be drawn away to another gospel, which he said is not another. Because when you follow another system of religion foreign to the gospel system as it's set out in the New Testament, then you're going to form an attitude of the heart, a disposition that is foreign to God. The highest, the closest, however you would say it, the most in-depth relationship you can have with God to be like Him only comes to full embracing of God's truth in the heart that from the heart there will come forth the fruit of righteousness. So when you deviate away from the doctrine of Christ, you can't have the attitude of Christ. You can't be formed into the likeness of Christ. And yet that's what it's all about, to be converted, to be forgiven of sins, to be like Christ. So a complete change is needed. That means the intellect must change. The emotions must change. The will of man must change. The conscience must change. There can be no complete change of heart until each one of those component parts, those necessary parts of the inward man or heart, has been total, totally and radically changed as the Bible says, the Word of God the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, that is sown in the heart. Does that help you better understand what the writer of Hebrews is saying about the Word of God? Now the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why that you must, as Paul said, preach the Word. And that's what happened to those people on that Pentecost when those apostles stood up and preached the pure and unadulterated and infallible Word of God. And they knew they were preaching God's Word because of the miracles they can work that proved that they were men of God. And thus, we have that same word today that is enjoined upon us to preach without addition, subtraction, alteration, or any kind of change. And when we know what the Bible said, but then we start trying to figure out ways that we can postpone it. It's the drag your feet faith. And let's just wait. That doesn't come from a good and honest heart. It comes from leftovers. Leftovers before baptism, when you were motivated by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, when you were not totally converted. You remember Peter so dedicated to the Lord? And yet one time the Lord said, though he was his disciple, he had already appointed him an apostle. He says, when you are converted, do thus and so. Now wait a minute. You've already selected him, Lord. You, you've already called him an apostle. You see where he is, how dedicated he is, and you mean tell me he's not converted? It's a process, folks doesn't happen sometimes at the snap of a finger. Here, believe, repent, best be baptized. I'm strong as the Apostle Paul after 40 years of service to God. No, you're not. 
You may not even understand fully what you just said. So the heart must be changed. That's a fact. From evil thoughts to good thoughts. From wicked reasoning to good reasoning. How do you know if you have wicked reasoning? When you understand what the plain old Word of God says and you know it applies to you and you start trying to figure out how to make yourself acceptable to God and not do it, you got a wicked heart. You say, oh, may not. You may not. What else would you have to have to make it wicked? You may go further and further into wickedness, but it's wicked. It's only a matter of degrees then. So it has to be changed from wicked reasoning to good reasoning. Uh, from ignorance of God's word to a proper knowledge of it. From unbelief to a scriptural belief, the belief that obeys. From despicableness to admiration. From the detestation of good to its desire. I firmly believe that a great many members of the Lord's church still set in judgment on what part of the doctrine is more important than the other part or maybe this is more gooder than this good part. And they've so gotten used to that, they don't even know they're doing it, except you can tell it. When a distasteful part of obeying God comes up, how quick do you jump to, to carry it out? Still the Word of God, still an obligation, still you must do in order to be faithful. Do you jump to carry it out? Or do you say, no, wait a minute, I think I'll let somebody else step ahead of me. It's sort of like, calling for volunteers in the army and you know the rule is never volunteer well in the army of the Lord I think some of my brethren sort of have that view especially in those distasteful things that have to be done now let's just wait a minute wait a minute let's go back to negotiations all you've done is just to bore forth the fruit of an unfaithful and wicked heart when you've done that we have to change from the love of the world to the love of the Lord. From trust and confidence in material and secular things and powers to complete trust in God based upon His right and divided word. From unrighteous determinations to righteous determinations. From unscriptural intentions to scriptural intentions. From unholy purposes to holy purposes. From disobedience to obedience. And from therefore a conscience that condemns us because intellectually we know the truth and we're not doing it. To a conscience that approves because you know the truth. And the attitude is, speak Lord thy servant heareth, command and I will obey. This is the change of heart which is essential to man's salvation. And when you actually... Look at each step in the plan of salvation. You will see when the person comes to scriptural baptism, they have already undergone this full change of heart. And if a person says, I want to be baptized, but they still have interest in this world and the affairs of this world, and they're not settled that they have to do everything the Lord says and all that kind of stuff. They sit in judgment on the Word of God. They're not ready to be baptized. It won't do them any good. Unless it's like get wet for no reason. And I can take it a bath and they do that. So the question is, how is this human heart changed as we've defined it? Well, the intellect is changed by evidence and testimony. It's changed from one state to another according to the evidence and the word of the living God that is preached or presented. Thomas's thoughts, his reasoning, his understanding, and his faith or belief were not changed until Jesus appeared to him and he had adequate evidence. And the Lord said to him, Reach hither thy finger and see my hands and reach hither thy hand and put it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Now, what did, what did Thomas do then? Well, I need a little more help here. A good and honest heart, and every component part of it, cried out, my Lord and my God. 
John 20, 24 through 29. The Word of God then is the testimony God has given to change man's intellect. These are written that ye might believe. John 20 and 31, speaking of the miracles Jesus worked. So believe cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Now the emotions are changed by faith, confidence, trust, in the testimony that's presented. It's the testimony believed that produces the change in the emotions. Despicableness, desire, love, and trust are the effects of the thing believed. It's faith in the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that produces the change, the necessary change in the sinner's emotions. From the desire of evil to the desire of good. From the love of the world to the love of Jesus Christ and all things pertaining to him. And from trust or confidence in material secular things to trust in the Lord and spiritual things as are set out in the word of God. The will is changed by motives produced by one's faith. Saul determined, he intended, and he purposed not to obey Christ, thinking that he was a false messiah or an imposter. We see this persecutor with a very determined will, traveling on the road to Damascus and Syria for no other purpose than to arrest Christians, to persecute them. Now Saul didn't have a New Testament like we do to read and ponder. But he had the audible word of Christ. And that changed his heart from unbelief to belief. Remember the Lord didn't appear to him just to uh, convert him. He appeared to him to make him an apostle. that could be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Christ. It's the gospel that still converted him. When he was told to be baptized and wash away his sins. Acts 22, 16. There's no hesitancy at all. Because he's already believed and repented of his sins. He unhesitatingly obeyed. A disobedient heart was changed by motives. Those motives were produced by proper faith. Belief in the goodness of Christ that he would forgive this persecutor. He himself called him the chief of sinners. Romans 2 and verse 4 is where he talks about the goodness of God being one of the things to lead a man to repentance. A motive, a belief in the reward of the obedient. Hebrews 5, 9. He believed that. He had confidence in it. He understood that. Also a motive to believe in the punishment of the disobedient. Revelation 20, 15. Now his faith in the word of God declaring those things was so strong that it led him to change his whole life. Saul's sins were washed away in his act of obedience, his obedience from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. Now what was obedient? The heart. What did we learn from the scriptures? The heart is. What was submissive to the will of Christ? Only his intellect? Only his will? Only his emotion? Only his conscience? The whole man, that is, inward man, our heart, was fully converted and changed and obedient. So one becomes free from sin and a servant of righteousness by obeying from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, and 18. The degree of confidence or faith which leads to salvation is simply a belief with all the heart. Remember what that means now. Which incites complete, total obedience from the heart. So no man's a servant of Christ until he obeys from the heart. No heart is right until it's an obedient heart. And no heart is obedient till the will, the intellect, the emotions, and the conscience are all moved according to the Word of God and only the Word of God. The conscience is changed by faith and having done right. 
If a man understands and believes what Christ has commanded, he can never have an approving conscience until he does it. For instance, baptism, you know, is a command. Peter said it was commanded at the household of Cornelius, Acts 10, in verse 48. That being true, if one understands and believes baptism is a command to be obeyed in order to enjoy the remission or forgiveness of sins, then he cannot have a clear conscience until he has been baptized as the Bible defines it and describes it. Notice how Peter put it. The like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's faith in having done right, having obeyed the commands of God, that changes the condemning conscience. The conscience does not hurt until one believes he has done wrong. And he can't believe he's done wrong till he has the right standard taught him. So, with a clear conscience, one serves God faithfully in the Lord's church to which the Lord added him when he obeyed the gospel. And he keeps his conscience clear as long as he's faithful to the Lord because he's a discharging all the obligations the New Testament places up on the child of God. Saul's condemning conscience was changed then to a state of approval by obeying Christ. Now keep in mind that also, we'll leave it at this, when a person undergoes all of that and is baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name, a saved relationship, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's done it all by the authority of Christ, in being baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ, Galatians 3.27, he changed states. The unconverted man can't change states. I don't care how many times he's baptized. Thus, proper knowledge is essential. It's absolutely necessary in order for a person to be baptized scripturally because it's at baptism that one leaves the lost state and by the Lord is added to the state of being saved. By the Lord remitting sins because you've been baptized in the death of Christ where the Lord applies His blood and that cleanses us from sin. It all comes back to proper knowledge of the truth as it relates to conviction that one is lost and conversion to Christ and the process in the plan of salvation. As old brother Marshall Keeble used to say, there's water in the plan. But the water itself saves nobody. But when you understand the teaching of the New Testament concerning water and baptism, with what precedes it and the necessity of the change of heart and how God changes it and that he can't do his part if you do not do yours, then you understand why it all comes down to why Peter would say it this way. Baptism doth also now save us. When the hearing of the word and understanding it has been done, when the belief brought about by reception of the evidence in the word has been done, when the repentance, which we're commanded to do, Acts 17, verse 30, is, has broken down the old stubborn will, the seed of all sin and rebellion against God, that's led one then to confess with the mouth his belief or confidence in Christ as the Son of God, and now obeys from the heart that form of doctrine, obeys from the heart that form of doctrine which delivered you. Then you're made free from sin. Not until then. If those other things are not understood, one has not obeyed the plan of salvation. One has not obeyed the gospel. One has just gone through the motions and the inward man remains unconverted and lost. There needs to be some study rather than saying, you want to become a Christian? Hear the gospel. Believe in Christ. Repent of your sins. Be saved when you're baptized. Well, that's true. But that's just touching the outline. It doesn't get into what each one of those steps really means that's necessary in you, in the one who would become a Christian. Do you need to become a Christian today? Do you need to have a change of heart? Now, you may have been baptized. God knows your heart. I don't. 
that you have right disposition toward God and yourself in the light of truth? Or are you still pretty much the same person this side of the water as you were before the water? And there are people like that. They need to do some serious soul searching. We only have this one life to get ready for eternity. And thus we better study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and then honestly apply it to our minds and go through the conversion process. You need to come to Jesus if you haven't done those things by obeying the gospel and being converted to him. And do it now while we stand and sing.